The Fellini film Eight and a Half begins with a particularly exemplary scene of his style. Namely, it begins with a dream, a nightmare. At the beginning of Eight and a Half, Guido is trapped inside a car and we never see his face. We only see the back of his head. He is surrounded by a large number of faces enclosed in other cars and other means of transportation. Sometimes they look at him. Sometimes they ignore him. As viewers of the film, we don't see his face, or if we identify with the character, we are able to think of ourselves as someone who cannot see their own face. This was the common condition of humanity before the use of mirrors became a common phenomenon. Now, mirrors are not only common, but they have been surpassed by the use of cameras for selfies on cell phones. We can continually look at ourselves, and in fact, we continuously verify our face, in some way, we verify that we have a face. In the next scene, after the traffic nightmare, Guido wakes up surrounded by doctors. We still don't see his face, but we see the faces of the people who look at him, who speak to him, who diagnose him, who interrogate him. Lying in a hospital bed, under the scrutiny of others, often leaves one feeling helpless and insecure about their appearance particularly since access to a mirror is usually limited in such situations. When we wake up after an operation, we are not sure who we are, how we are, what has happened to our body, our face, our identity. We have to reconstruct ourselves thanks to the gaze that others direct towards us. In the movie, the words of the doctors who surround Guido somehow reassure him. He is a director. He is famous. A giorni alterni applicazioni di fango di 20 minuti. Dopo ogni fango bagno d'acqua madre per 10 minuti secondo prescrizione. Alimentazione... Spedierò alla fonte, vuole. Sì, Allo grazie. scadere della prima settimana di cura, una sospensione di due giorni di tutte le cure prescritte. In a face-off scene by John Woo, we see one of the two protagonists waking up in a hospital bed with his face completely bandaged. The character removes the bandages, approaches a window and sees his own face immersed in a physiological solution beyond a glass. It's a nightmare different from Fellini's character. Fellini's nightmare concerns uncertainty about one's identity, but in John Woo's film, the terrifying situation consists of waking up with someone else's face. At the end of the initial scene of Eight and a Half, Guido is recognized and can also look in a mirror. The character in Face Off sees their own face in a place where it should not be. That is, not on their face, but beyond the glass, in another room. The particularly unsettling effect of Face Off is that the exchange of faces takes place between two actors particularly recognizable to audiences around the world, John Travolta, and Nicolas Cage. Let's try to imagine a world where mirrors are not available. How could we live? Would the word face still have the same meaning? Can we imagine a face made up of detachable and infinitely recombinable elements? This is the case of the first toy ever advertised on television, Hasbro's Mr. Potato Head. The original version of the popular toy required children to use real potatoes and assemble the parts provided with it to create a face. However, the effect was unsettling since children could randomly put together facial features, resembling a cubist experiment similar to Picasso's work where the perspective of facial features could be decomposed and rearranged from different viewpoints, leading to a sense of discordance. It is quite interesting that the first toy ever advertised on television is a toy that so radically questions a fundamental aspect of existence, that is, identity. Let's do another experiment. Let's try to imagine a face that varies completely 
depending on the subject's moods or situation. This is something that already happens to everyone, of course. Everyone can have a happy, sad, surprised, or impassive face. But if these characteristics of variability were pushed to the extreme, all faces would in some way become caricatures. In general, we can interpret a caricature to understand the signals it wants to send us. But if we were not able to interpret these signs, we might get one of the most enigmatic characters in the DC Comics universe, Rorschach. Rorschach doesn't really have eyes, mouth, or nose. His face is presented as an enigma, like a stain to be interpreted. How many times have we tried to interpret the facial expressions of the people we loved? How many times have we tried to pick up on small signs, small details that would help us understand what was happening in the mind and emotions of another person? In the anxious and perhaps a little paranoid, search for these signs. At some point we could see the other person's face disintegrate into its parts. A fold of the mouth, a dilation of the nostrils, a gaze that escapes, an arching of an eyebrow, a furrowed wrinkle. We can become so obsessed with a single detail of a face that we forget the face itself, as in Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Telltale Heart, where the protagonist claims to be pursued not by a person, but only by a part of his face, an evil eye that he illuminates one night with a beam of light. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. In Not I, Samuel Beckett employs a method of focusing on a specific facial feature, namely the mouth, to convey the protagonist's story through rapid speech that is challenging to follow. The mouth is driven by an irrefutable and uncontrollable urge to speak. The expression losing face is common in many languages and often means a loss of honor or a feeling of deep shame. People who have suffered a serious disfigurement of the face often have serious problems with social interaction. In a French film from 1960, Eyes Without a Face, a girl following an accident is forced to live with an expressionless mask on her face. The girl's father, a surgeon, kills other girls in an attempt to restore a face to his daughter. The impulse to represent oneself on Instagram, and especially one's own face, could have to do with the terrible doubt of not having one's own face. In particular, the extensive use of filters that tend to make faces all look alike, eliminating imperfections but also particularities, often achieves the effect of recalling the expressionless mask of the protagonist of eyes without a face. Many paintings by Magritte depict characters with their faces covered by an object, an apple, a dove, a bouquet of violets. In a famous painting, we see two lovers kissing with their faces covered by a veil. When walking down the street, if we see two people kissing and can't resist the temptation to observe them, we often can't distinguish their faces from each other since they are so tightly pressed together in that kiss. Do they still have their own faces? When you kiss a person, the other's face disappears into excessive closeness, into excessive proximity. Their face, as Proust says, becomes a landscape, a pure sensation. When you kiss a person, the boundaries of two faces blur. In De Chirico's work, we see the recurring figures of faceless mannequins, similar to the mannequins used in drawing schools to represent the human body. De Chirico's painterly style, called metaphysics, perhaps should make us think that these are representations of an abstract individual who represents everyone and no one, the simple unknown of an equation, an X. In Hawthorne's story, The Minister's Black Veil, a pastor presents himself to his flock with his face permanently covered by a black veil that only reveals his mouth, somewhat reminiscent of Beckett's character in Not I. At no point in the story does Hawthorne explain the motivations of the preacher, though various interpretations, often of a religious nature, are given by readers for this form of self-representation. 
In particular, many readers think that the veil represents the weight of guilt that afflicts every human individual. But let's try another hypothesis. Could it be that the weight of a face is not easy to bear? In Francis Bacon's paintings, faces are disfigured by a stroke of the sponge and somehow resemble the faces of war veterans hit by shrapnel or burns. What is the impulse that drives Bacon to use this technique in portraits of people he loves, or even in self-portraits? The hypothesis of the face as a weight difficult to bear is further developed by Samuel Beckett in his film, starring Buster Keaton, where the character constantly tries to escape any vision of his own face by hiding any surface that could create a reflection. A sort of anti-narcissus. If therefore in many narrative and film works we have seen the absence of the face experienced as terrifying, Beckett thinks of this possibility as a liberation.